Are you thinking about getting some type of cosmetic surgery, specifically breast augmentation or enhancement or labiaplasty? If you are, I'm sure that you want to have as much information as you possibly can in order to make an informed decision. In this video, we're going to cover some information and details uh, that I've encountered with some clients that have come to me professionally that might help to inform your decision. And as a side note, if you ride motorcycles or bicycles a lot or go horseback riding on a regular basis, there's a little bit of information in this video that might provide some uh, important details as to how those activities could possibly affect you. So keep watching. Welcome to the Wishing Wellness YouTube channel. My name is Jim Fats, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor and a licensed massage therapist and body worker. And today's topic actually plays into both of my practice areas. I want to be clear up front that my scope of practice does not include medicine. I am not a medical doctor, and nothing in this video should be construed to convey any type of medical advice or medical information. Currently, in our society, if you listen to the news, the radio, look at the newspaper, or talk to other people, you will hear a lot of information about North Korea, the Russians, immigration, gender differences, uh, issues between Democrats and Republicans. Our society is pretty much bombarded by uh, people being critical of each other, being judgmental, uh, holding each other to perfectionistic expectations. And it's my opinion that this societal norm contributes to some of the decision-making process we make about our lives, either consciously or subconsciously. It's not surprising to understand that a 2016 research study by the International Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons found that the United States was the country with the highest rate of people seeking cosmetic surgery. I'd like for a moment just to reset a little bit of a baseline point. I'd like you to take a minute and look at this picture with me. When we're conceived, when the sperm hits the egg, we are all females for several days. People, people debate about how long of a period of time that is, but somewhere between five and seven days, we're all females. It's not until after a short period of time that the Y chromosome develops and starts to create male characteristics. As humans, with some rare exceptions, we all have 206 bones in the body, 650 named muscles, we have two arms with 10 fingers, two legs with 10 toes, we all have the same organs, we have two eyes, two ears, a mouth, a nose, we, need a, we all need a certain percentage of oxygen to live, we need food, we need rest, we all have to go to the bathroom. The reality is, if you look at us in totality, we are much, much more alike each other than we are different. And yet people focus for some reason on the exceptions. They'll look at skin pigmentation and decide that the color of skin is important or the shape of someone's eyes are important. For some reason, we tend to focus on the differences. And we tend to focus on those differences in judgmental or critical ways. So it's not surprising that some people, and in my practice uh, for these topics, I typically have female clients, so I'm gonna primarily refer to females. Females may feel that they, they don't fit a certain standard they'll look at a friend or they'll look at somebody on TV or they'll look at a magazine and they'll feel that they don't fit a specific um, ideal body type or shape. And this, this sense of uh, feeling insecure, uncertain about the body leads to people trying to make a decision as to whether or not they want to artificially improve their body. The other, the other possibility that occurs is that um, in relationships, 
people inadvertently make a comment or they're being hurtful and they make a comment and they criticize another person and that comment sticks with that person. And when I've seen a lot of clients in, in early dating years, somebody might have made a comment about the size of somebody's breast or the shape of their labia. Um, the, the, it's stuck with the person for a long period of time and it's made them think that for some reason they don't meet uh, a certain standard or they don't look a certain way that they should look and it causes them to make decisions to seek out cosmetic surgery. The reality is when I've really explored these issues with clients, in almost all cases, the people that made the comment to them was, was relatively naive, uninformed, or not very experienced being around a lot of other people and really having a good basis for their judgments in the first place. So the first step in this process is to really question the motivation as to why it is you're seeking cosmetic surgery. Everybody is entitled to their choice, whether it's for cosmetic purposes or reconstructive purposes. You have the right to make a choice to change your body type. The problem is that a lot of people don't anticipate the consequences of that decision. So for example today, our first area, I'd like to talk about breast augmentation or breast enhancement. Usually when somebody goes through a procedure for breast augmentation or breast enhancement, they they receive one of several different types of incisions. The incisions can be in the armpit called transaxillary, in the area of the nipple, the areola, areola where the skin changes color, that's called periareola, a periareolar incision. Underneath the breast, called inframammary incisions, or somewhere in the area of the umbilical um, the belly button or the umbilical area. Now the, the, the first issue rests with these incisions. Incisions are a, are a cut into the tissue and the organ of the skin. Um, very superficial in the skin are, are nerves and also um, right underneath the skin are areas of fluid sheds as part of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is responsible for clearing out cellular debris. It helps us with our immune system and to fight um, infections. And it's a very passive system. And it, it, it's, it's also interconnected with the lymph nodes. And there's a high percentage of lymph nodes in the armpits and in the breast tissue area. And any incision into these areas can cause problems with the lymphatic system fluid flow. People have swelling or um, they have uh, tenderness. They might be more prone to infections or clearing out that area of the body after an incision. Another consideration from the incision is there's a new uh, discovery of a, what, what people are referring to as a new organ called uh, the interstitial organ. And there's research going on right now regarding that organ and how it affects the body. Everything I'm saying today is based on um, common knowledge and scientific research and I will include uh, links to almost everything that I'm describing uh, in the video in the comments below. So besides the, the physical impact to the lymphatic system and the interstitium, uh, another issue with incisions is nerve damage. So nerves take a very long time to regenerate and there's some actual debate as to whether or not nerves can really even reconnect as opposed to regenerate. So the goal of the incision is to make it as small and as clean and perfect as possible so that there's minimal scarring, minimal uh, adhesions uh, to the tissue. And when they make a, a surgical cut, the cut is very clean all of the nerve endings in that area end at exactly the same spot. And that causes potential distal or downstream nerve um, impairment, lack of sensation, tingling, numbness, or, or strange sensations. Uh, it, also, it also can potentially cause a deadening of the tissue below the area of the incision. And this is particularly uh, concerning in the area of the areola because um, nipple sensitivity can be significantly impacted. It's interesting to note that, you know, contrary to the, the clean incision, a ragged incision 
is actually a little bit nicer from a healing standpoint because the tissue and the nerves can mesh to do a healing and there's not as clear as a break as, as there is with a surgical incision. And that's why some obstetricians, when they're delivering babies, no longer take scissors or a scalpel and cut the perineum because a clean surgical cut in the perineum causes a lot of lack of sensitivity on a go-forward basis. So issue number one is the simple incision itself. Now the other issue with breast reconstruction or enhancement um, or augmentation is a muscular issue. As part of the procedure, some type of an implant is placed underneath the pectoralis muscle, muscles, either fully or partially. The pectoralis muscles attach to the ribs, the sternum, and to the side of the body, but they also attach up at the collarbone, at the head of the humerus, and they also attach to a piece of the scapula. Now the scapula is a bone in the back, but it's, the scapula has a projection of bone forward and the muscles of the pecs attach actually to the front part of the scapula. When this implant is placed under the pec muscles, it causes a constant tension on those muscles, which causes the shoulder to roll forward and lift. That rolling forward and lifting is something that the person can't really control because the implant itself is pulling the muscle forward and causing the shoulder to roll forward. This rolling forward of the shoulder and the raising of the shoulder creates a constant tension in back muscles, the rhomboid muscles between the shoulder blades, parts of the trapezius muscles which go all the way up the neck and create this uh, curve in our neck down to our shoulder, and also subscapularis muscles, muscles which are muscles that are inside the body underneath the scapula. When these muscles are chronically tight and stretched, people start to notice tingling, burning, sharp sensations and pain in the back of the neck between the shoulder blades, in particular right on the large prominence of the uh, cervical and thoracic joint area in the back of the neck. There's a large bump there and people sometimes find that there's just a deep burning pain. Now when people come to me for body work, a lot of times I, I, can, I can almost always tell that people have had some type of augmentation or implants just because of the way the muscles feel and the way the shoulders are positioned. And body work can help the symptoms of the neck pain and the back burning and the tingling and the numbness, but it only helps temporarily because the ongoing cause of the problem is the implant underneath the pec muscles. So, these are just some of the considerations regarding uh, breast augmentation or enhancement. There's a lot of other considerations, but these are the ones that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with clients. And it really begs the issue as to whether or not people are considering the future ramifications of the decision when the decision might simply be based on a misperception of their body type or their body image. And that misperception of their body type and body image can range from just a simple observation that they don't like the way something looks a little bit, all the way to a mental health diagnostic criteria called body dysmorphia, where people truly have a misperception of the size, shape, um, and other characteristics of their body. Another important area that I deal with with some clients, uh, because I do uh, sex therapy and, and talk about sexual dysfunction issues, along with the body work is labiaplasty. Now, labiaplasty is fairly common. Um, it, it appears to me that many females uh, have a, a certain insecurity with how their labia looks. Now, the, as we talked at the very beginning of the video, we are much, much more alike than we are different. The variations in labia size and, and how much the labia protrudes is really is really a pretty minimal variation between all types of people. But yet, because of uh, sexual encounters or comments that might be made, to, made by people, or just general misunderstandings or interpretation of what people said, sometimes women are very self-conscious about the way their labia looks. 
and they talk to a cosmetic surgeon and have labiaplasty, which reduces or modifies the size or the shape of the labia. And typically, this deals with the labia minora protruding a little bit further out of the labia majora, and people find that to be uncomfortable and, and potentially unsightly. There's some, there's some big issues that surround labiaplasty, and I'd like to talk about those now. I'd like you to look at this picture in order to get a better understanding of the possible issues that can surround labiaplasty. So there's a nerve called the pedendal nerve, and the pedendal nerve originates in the back, out of the spine, as do most nerves. That's where the root of the nerve is. And, and that nerve comes through the sacrum and goes through an opening in the pelvic girdle called a, a foramen. And then that nerve makes its way into the pelvic floor and into the um, genitalia. This next picture shows a little bit of a better diagram with the actual anatomy in place. You can see that the pedendal nerve, uh, there's a left pedendal nerve and a right pedendal nerve. And that pedendal nerve goes to the clitoris, the labia, the perineum, the anus, and all the pelvic floor muscles. It completely provides the majority of sensations that exist in the pelvic floor and, and the, the genitalia. I've had numerous situations where clients have come to me and they've had sexual dysfunction issue, issues or significant pain post labiaplasty. And a lot of this seems to be due to something called um, pedendal neuralgia or just general pedendal inflammation. The impact from the pedendal neuralgia, neuralgia or the pedendal inflammation uh, is, is pretty broad. It can result in loss of sensitivity in the clitoris, in the labia. That causes problems with arousal. Arousal then causes problems with uh, lubrication. Um, there can be a sense of sensitivity in the anus, anal itching, vaginal itching. The perineum area may become numb. The overall impact of pedendal nerve issues is, is pretty broad. And sometimes it has to do with um, the surgery itself where the nerve has become irritated and the irritated nerve works its way up to the nerve root and therefore it causes a broader impact to the whole area. And sometimes it's just an exacerbation of a pre-existing problem with pedendal nerve impingement. And by that I mean, if you remember the picture, the pedendal nerve as it comes out of the sacrum it goes in through the butt muscles, the gluteus muscles and the piriformis muscles. And if somebody already has, is predisposed to having a tight back or tight glutes, and the pedendal nerve is just barely uh, impinged or irritated, and then on top of that, labiaplasty occurs. And as part of the labiaplasty, as part of the labiaplasty, the nerve becomes more irritated. That can cause a much more significant impact. And there are things you can do uh, in many, many cases for uh, the negative consequences of labiaplasty and pedendal nerve issues. One of the most common things is to really work the back muscles, the sacrum, the gluteus muscles, the piriformis muscles in order to release those muscles so that the nerve root is not impinged or pinched or being pressed upon. The other thing that can be done is to work uh, gently the, the perineum area the area around the labia, the area around the anus, in order to loosen those muscles and improve blood flow and create a better, uh, healthier environment for the nerve to regenerate and settle down. So while sometimes pedendal nerve issues are long-standing, sometimes they're able to be resolved with body care and body work, um, it, it, it's a consideration that a lot of people don't take into account prior to deciding to get labiaplasty. So the whole, the whole point of this conversation is that it, it, it sometimes seems to be an easy step to choose cosmetic surgery. 
and it seems to be a quick fix to a problem that is a perceived problem when in reality it it may not really be an issue at all it might just be a misperception a miscommunication an aspect of miseducation what I would highly recommend is in addition to talking to your healthcare practitioner and your plastic or cosmetic surgeon I would recommend talking to a counselor that's not affiliated with those service providers or even a really good friend and just be very honest about how you feel about your body what your perceptions are about your body and why it is that you really want to choose some type of an elective cosmetic surgery because in a majority of cases the clients that come to me after they've had the, the, the procedures done and after we've had some, some either uh, consultation or we've done some body work and massage to resolve issues in almost every case my clients often say to me had they known then what they know now and really talked about these issues and some of the potential problems they probably would not have chosen to get the elective surgery in the first place and while I've talked in this video about breast um, plastic surgery or labiaplasty this this topic really applies to just about anything it could uh, liposuction or any any major modifications to the structure of the body has potential negative impact and people just don't really talk about it that much now as an aside since we've talked about about the pedendal nerve another interesting thing that um, I find with some clients that come to me for sexual dysfunction issues either not being able to have orgasms or not being able to have an erection or not being able to ejaculate in some cases there's a common theme and that also has to do with the pedendal nerve people who have a long history of uh, riding uh, racing bicycles with very very hard seats or they've been riding motorcycles for a long time with a lot of vibration and their legs being stretched across the seat or people who have been horseback riding for a long time and they have constant jarring and agitation to the pelvic area um, all of those activities can also affect the pedendal nerve and in many cases issues of sexual dysfunction stand alone or issues of sexual dysfunction in addition to labiaplasty or other pedendal nerve issues seems to be the root cause of some sexual dysfunction issues so all in all I hope you uh, take into account some of these other details and pieces of information regarding breast augmentation and breast surgery. I mean, even in the situation where mastectomies have occurred and it's not really uh, a, a cosmetic surgery as much as it is reconstruction, all of the details that we've discussed in this video still apply. People are beautiful naturally. The minimal variations that we have between uh, different people are relatively small and those differences really represent uh, a, a great uh, diversity that can be celebrated. And it, it's, it's nothing to really want to hide or modify in order to be just part of the herd or the crowd. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's provided some additional information to you in helping you make a decision if you're considering um, any of these possible procedures or options. As I said, Below this video in, in the comments, I have links to the majority of uh, information that I discussed here to show that it's valid and there's some, some backup resources there. If you're interested in subscribing to this channel, I'd love for you to do so. Um, that way you'll be informed of future videos. If you think this video is useful or you know somebody that's considering some of these options, please pass this video along. I'd like to thank you for taking your time uh, to watch this video and I hope you have a great day. Thanks.